Hi, my name is Lynette Lortz, and I um, taught an environmental justice data science lesson for grade eight um, in my Python programming course. So this course, actually, we typically do programming for this course, but in this case, we did not do this. And we did this over the course of two days. And the classes are also 50 minutes. So the idea of this course was to introduce them to environmental justice and data science. So previously, they've probably heard of these terms before, uh, maybe on the internet, or they saw them on the internet, or they saw them in the news, but this was their first experience with actually understanding environmental justice and data science and how they are actually connected. So, um, as I said, my name is Lynette Lortz. I'm a computer science teacher at South Fayette Township School District. I teach grades eight through 12. And um, like I said, this lesson was done in my Python programming course, but I also teach a course um, in high school a data science course for grades nine through 12. So I have done um, in my high school course, I had done a variation of this lesson. So whenever I was thinking about this lesson, I had to think about how I could do something for eighth graders and that something that eighth graders would really be engaged in and understand a little bit better. So I had to make a little bit, uh, quite a few changes actually to a lesson that I had previously done in my high school course. So the session agenda, I'll start with an introduction and then I'll go through the planning process that I did as I was creating this lesson or adapting this lesson. And then I'll talk a little bit about what this lesson entails and the challenges that I faced as I was creating this lesson and doing this lesson. And then finally, some of the lessons I learned and some of the mistakes that I've made and how I would make changes to this lesson in the future. So the hardest part of this lesson was thinking of a title that encapsul encapsulates everything that we had covered. In this lesson, we used a lot of different resources. So figuring out a title for the lesson was very difficult because we use a lot of resources. So the title that I came up with that encapsulates everything was using visualizations to inspire curiosity. How does our environment affect us? And as I've said, this was with an eighth grade course over two to um, over two days and our classes are 50 minutes in length. So the planning process was I've already done something similar to this in my high school course. This was a few years ago. So I had to make some pretty significant changes to this lesson. So the planning lessons lesson or the planning process was, as with every teacher, we always think about what do we want students to leave with? What do we want students to understand? What are they gonna get out of this lesson? So some of the things that I needed to think about as I was creating this course or this lesson was it had to fit into two to three days because this was an introduction for students. I didn't want it to take up too much time and it's just a little information that's what data science is, what environmental justice is and what their connection is. So I didn't want it to take up too much time. And then we, um, I also wanted them to leave with a better understanding of what data science is. They are surrounded by data science every day, all of the time they use it on social media, but do they actually understand what data science is and why is it important to us? Finally, I wanted, um, I wanted them to look at the job outlook because data science is such an in need job right now. They needed to understand that it's related to everything and the job market for it is huge right now. Then uh, we moved into what is environmental justice and why is it important? And then I also wanted them to be curious. Data science is um, encouraging students to be curious, encouraging them to think a little bit more in depth. Then I wanted them to ask questions. And I always tell students too, as you're looking at something, as you're analyzing a graph or some, tor so, some type of visualization, uh, you're probably putting, there are questions in your mind that are going through your mind, but now we need to just vocalize those questions. And then finally, working as a team. Working as a team, I've understood throughout the years, especially whenever teaching data science, is working as a team is a huge part of it. And every single lesson that I do that involves data science is uh, students having to do teamwork of some kind. The reason we do so much teamwork is because um, they bounce ideas off each other. So one student 
They do something independently at first. He'll have an idea. He or she will have an idea. Then once, once they work as a team, they start to talk about it. They communicate their different ideas. And then they start to um, come up with bounce ideas off of each other. And one student may notice a detail while another student doesn't notice that detail. So they start to kind of get more ideas as they communicate um, what their findings were. So they bounce ideas off each other. And that's a huge part of teaching anything related to data science is group work. So I wanted them to get these main concepts out of this um, lesson. And what the lesson entailed was uh, day one was what is data science? So typically whenever um, I ask this question, I ask what data science is. Sometimes I'll get one or two students that put their hand up and they understand what it is. But most of the time it's kind of crickets. You look around and nothing's really happening. So then I tell students, well, let's break the term up. What is data? What is science? And then we put them together. It's a study of data. Data science though, it's a study of big amounts, large amounts of data. Um, once we started to talk a little bit about more what data science is, um, I talk about because of the internet, data is at our finger, fingertips all the time. And an example of this is prior to the internet, if we wanted to do research on cancer, we would have to go to doctor's offices, we would have to go to hospitals and get these huge patient records and go through them paper by paper and write down details, write down information, write down our data. But that would take so long. It would take years upon years upon years upon years to get all this information. But because of the uh, invention of the internet, we have data at our fingertips all the time. So for example, I can find a data set on avocado sales for millennials in California. That's a real data set. I can find cancer rates. I can find um, song shuffling or most popular songs on Spotify, or I can find so much data because of the internet. So um, then I move students into the example, what is, what's happening today that there is enormous amounts of data. And most of the time students think right away COVID. Because of COVID, we have so much information all of the time. So if we think about it in Western PA, we have, um, we have the data from Western PA. So that could be cancer, or that could be um, vaccination, that could be hospitalization. So all of that data, then from there you move out, well, the state data, from there you move out United States data. So we just keep moving out and that data is enormous and there's so much of it. So what we do now with data science is we create algorithms that can go through all of that data, enormous amounts of data, where it, whereas it would take a human hundreds of years to go through that data. A computer and an algorithm can go through it like that very quickly. So we start to talk about the connection with technology and data and how that has changed from the past and why data science is so important today. From there, we talk about the job outlook. Job outlook for data scientists is huge right now. Um, and the connection with AI. And then we start to connect it with, well, what do you do that involves data science? So they start to think about social media. Some students are interested in social media. That's a job if they're interested in marketing. Um, data science is a job right there. So data science has a connection to absolutely every discipline there is. Um, from there, we move into environmental justice. This concept was a little bit tricky for students to understand um, because this was essentially one of their first um, lessons in, in environmental justice. So I give them the example of the DuPont plant in Parkersburg, Virginia. And if you've seen the movie Dark Waters, this is that story where DuPont was putting chemicals into the water system for the people in Parkersburg and they were getting very sick. Their livelihoods were changing because of uh, the water going into um, what they were feeding or giving their animals to drink. And um, they had huge, many, many, many problems due to what DuPont was doing. And DuPont was saying it's perfectly fine. So it wasn't until a lawyer in Cincinnati um, came into um, came to find out what that story was, and they actually uh, brought DuPont to court for this. And these people who were in Parkersburg were actually, um, they received justice from that. 
because of all the things DuPont was doing and they were um, typically a poor community. So they, um, DuPont went to, they had, they got justice because of what DuPont was doing to them. So they get, they get that example of it. From there, we move into a looking 10 times two activity. That activity, if you look at the screen, there is a circle with the word image in the inside. So this is actually from Project Zero from Harvard. And from there, we, we actually do teamwork for this. So what I did with students was I showed them that picture, the dark, uh, the black and white picture with the steps. They looked at that picture individually at first. And I tell them, look at that picture for 30 seconds, let your eyes wander. Don't write anything, don't say anything, just look at it. After the 30 seconds is up, they get on a, a scrap piece of paper and they write details, words or phrases of, that they find. So an example could be smoke, could be factory, could be steps, it could be snow. So they write 10 words or phrases that they recognize. After that, we take 30 more seconds. Just look at it. Don't write anything. Don't say anything. And then they write 10 or more, 10 um, more words or phrases that they recognize from it. And round two, they start to get look more into the details. They start to understand a little bit more. It's a little bit harder because they're searching now, but they're looking more in depth. Once we do that, we actually go into what is called the circle map, which is that circle with the word image in the inside. They write their round one. They're in groups of four. They write their round one words or phrases in red, and then they write their round two words or phrases in a different color, such as blue or um, green in this case. So from there, we work as a team, where as a team, they start to think about well, what do you notice? What do you notice about those words or phrases that you wrote? What is the difference between round one and round two? So they start to think about what do you notice? And then we do what do you wonder? So what do you notice would be like observations they make, such as most teams put the word pollution or most teams put the word um, clouds or something like that. And then we move into, like I said, what do you wonder? What questions do you have? These questions don't necessarily have answers, though. And then um, we analyze this as a class. So what we did is we put all team circle maps on the board and we analyze that data as a class. So we collect the data and then we also analyzed it as a class. That was day one. Day two was a little bit less group work. Day two, we started with a data talk. So a data talk is um, students are given an image of something with no prior knowledge of it, and they have to analyze it. And you start with questions like, what do you notice and what do you wonder? So for this one, we looked at the map of the American air pollution. And first they looked at it independently, and then we did a class discussion. We talked about what do you notice, what do you wonder? And one of the key things that I learned during this is giving um, an answer wait time. So what I mean by that is whenever you say, what do you notice? You don't call in the first student that puts their hand up. You wait a couple seconds, let students really think about it. And then they would put their hand up and they would, um, the students who you typically don't talk in class, those are the students who will put their hand up, which was um, a huge part of this, which was really nice to see the students who typically are a little bit more quiet and they don't participate as much. They felt comfort more comfortable participating in this. So we started with that and the idea we did that for the idea that we start with that is because then they start to think about more details. They start to think about more in depth. So it's a very good activity to start um, this lesson with. So from there, we moved into Earth Time. Earth time is a great resource where you see changes over time. So um, it could be climate changes, it could be refugee changes. So Earth time is a really great resource of so many different um, data layers. And in this case, we looked at the data layer fires at night. Students had no prior knowledge of what fires at night actually meant. We talked about um, infrared light though. And we looked at the world and all the infrared light, the infrared light that's happening in the world. But then we started to zoom into our area. So we zoomed into the Pittsburgh area and students noticed that there was a constant infrared light in a certain area. And this was actually happening in Braddock, PA at, um, well, I actually started with what is in that area. So then students had to research where that was happening. And then they had to research what it was, what was happening. 
in Braddock, PA. From there, they figured out that it was the US Steel, Edgar Thompson Steelworks. They had to research, well, what do they produce? Why is there an infrared light there? So um, students started to figure out that black carbon was being admitted into, the, into our air. And then we talked about well, what does black carbon do to your body? What's happening to our bodies as we're breathing this in? Who is this affecting? We moved into the um, Western PA Regional Data Center and we looked at childhood asthma rates. There were quite a few students in my class who had asthma um, or knew of someone who had asthma. So this was really a great connection to them where they started to really think about their environment and things that were breathing in constantly. Um, they started to analyze where these asthma rates were happening in children uh, what areas, and they started to look for patterns where there were pockets of students with higher asthma rates. They started to connect it to some of the um, industries in our area, such as the Edgar Thompson uh, Steelworks. They started to make that connection. Well, that's really close to the Edgar Thompson Steelworks, or that's really close to this other plant that produces um, a chemical that is output into our air. So they started to really think about the connection and how black carbon actually happens to them, uh, actually affects the body. And then we started to then move into um, looking at poverty rates for those areas too. So this was a really interesting connection that students were really able to internalize how this is affecting them or how this is affecting their lives. And they started to really think about the air that we breathe every day in Pittsburgh's air quality um, compared to other areas around the uh, United States. And then we finally ended with looking at the Breathe Cam. The Breathe Cam is a camera that, uh, cameras that are throughout the area that are constantly on these power plants, or these, not just power plants, but these plants. So we looked at the uh, Breathe Cam for um, Edgar Thompson Steel, or Edgar Thompson Works, and what they were outputting right at that exact time. So they were actually able to create a personal connection to this lesson and to really understand who this is affecting and why this is affecting and what's, what's happening or what's not happening to help uh, protect us. So this was a nice lesson for them to really internalize you know, that connection. So those that happened over the course of two days. Some of the challenges and future changes that I would make to this would be on day one, we talked about what is environmental justice. We talked about that uh, definition provided from the EPA and they were given that definition. It's a mouthful and it's a lot for an eighth grader to really um, understand, I think. They understood it, but it was difficult for them to really make that connection. So something that I would do, a potential change that I would do would be to um, have groups create their own definition. So they're given the EPA definition, but I want you to put into your own words and create a definition that will explain what you think environmental justice is. And then we would place them throughout the room and they would be able to look at others' um, ideas for what environmental justice is. On day two, something that I would change is we didn't do very much group work on day two. So some of the changes that I would make would be to incorporate more group work. So um, that encapsulated both open-ended questions and also group discussion. So starting off with questions like, what do you notice? As they're looking at a visualization such as the asthma one, well, what do you notice? What do you wonder? They do it individually at first, and then we work as a, they would work as a group of four to bounce ideas off each other. And then another question would be, how does this affect your community? How does this affect you? How does it affect your family? And then also, finally, once we do the individual, the group work, we would share it out as a class. And some students, some groups may um, look at some details that another group didn't look at. So more group work, I would... Um, put into the day two of this lesson. So lessons learned. Um, some of the lessons that I learned is allow students to lead discussions. It's really difficult as an educator to kind of let go of the reins, but 
in this case, I had one group in particular that just kind of went off on this and we ended up somewhere where I never expected us to, to end up. But it was very interesting to hear their ideas and kind of let them bounce ideas off each other or questions off each other or answer each other's questions. So allowing students to lead the discussion was a very big one. Give ample wait time. I remember when I was in college that professors would say, don't call on a, call on a student right after you answer a question. Give that quiet time where students can really think about the answer to that question because you'll see more hands go up. And that is very true, especially when teaching something like this is allowing time to let them really think about it or to really come up with an answer. And you're going to see more hands go up after that. It's uncomfortable. That quiet time is a little bit uncomfortable, but you're going to get better answers, better questions than you typically would if you call someone right away. And then also allowing students to branch ideas off each other. And then finally, allowing students to go down the rabbit hole um, to incur, encourage their curiosity. And what I mean from that is they might start with a topic and end with a topic where you didn't expect it to go, but they're, they're inspiring their own curiosity, which is a really great thing to see, especially whenever you're teaching something like this. Um, Something else that I want to talk about a little bit is in this, this actual lesson kind of leads into something that we use in our high school, which is U-Cubed. It's a data science course provided by Stanford. And it's a very awesome resource, which is some of the resources that I use in this lesson actually came from it, such as a data talk. They created data talks. And in our high school class, we actually do data science with some parts of environmental justice included into it. And some of the resources that we use are uh, CODAP, which is a really great resource, resource whenever you look at any data. We also use a program called Tableau. Tableau is used by industry, industry professionals to analyze data visualizations to create data visualizations then to analyze them. And then we also use CoLab, which is created by Google. We use Python programming for that. So some of the really great resources for data science, and they also have some environmental justice pieces in there, are um, some lessons provided from them through K through 12. They're still expanding upon those, but they're um, wonderful lessons, really well thought out. And then there's also a high school course for data science, which is really great and I have nothing but wonderful things to say about them. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, feel free to email me or you can also connect with me on Twitter. Thank you.